All right. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Sam Cook, and I'm going to be moderating this year's <clears throat> Portsmouth School Board Candidate Forum. Um, <clears throat> before we start, a uh, couple, I want to go over the format of what's going to happen tonight. Um, so first was I solicited questions from the public. So we took our community questions, and I will be asking uh, some of those questions of the candidates over the opening hour. Uh, the candidates were informed of the question topics yesterday, but this is the first time they'll be seeing or hearing the exact, uh, the, the exact questions. Uh, response order has been randomized for each question, and candidates will have up to one minute to respond, and everyone will be able to see a timer so that we're able to keep on track and ask as many questions as possible. Uh, candidates are encouraged to leave time on the table to promote more time for additional questions. Uh, if you know there are going to be some questions that do that, that do have shorter shorter possible answers. After that, we'll have a half hour where anybody in the audience is able to ask a question of uh, of the candidates, and it could be of an individual or of groups of candidates. And when we get to that portion, I'll go over some ground rules for that towards the end. Um, the other thing is I want to situate and make sure everyone's on board with what the school board does. The school board has three main functions. The functions of the school board are the Portsmouth School District budget policy and the hiring and the evaluation of the superintendent. So with that said, we are going to get started with introductions. And on every slide here, you'll see for the candidates, you'll see the order in which you're going to answer each question. So we're gonna start with Carrie Nolte and each candidate will introduce themselves and answer the following question, which is what makes you each uniquely qualified to be an excellent school board member. So Carrie Nolte, please start us off. Thanks so much, Sam. Um, I am Carrie Nolte. My, um, this is the first time I've been involved in um, kind of local um, politics or a campaign, um, but I just saw an opportunity where my expertise could be of use to the school board um, now. Um, and so it's really to me an offer to serve more than a campaign. I'm a nursing professor at the University of New Hampshire and also a part-time family nurse practitioner at Families First, where I work on the healthcare for the homeless van. And so I think from a, um, a university level education perspective, there's a lot of similar themes around curriculum and policies. And especially with the health aspects, I think social and emotional health is critical to our students. Um, and I've done quite a bit of work on that. And also, you know, COVID and, and just really decision making and um, using the best guidelines and, and making decisions that give parents, families, and teachers time to um, adjust. Thank you, candidate Nolte. Next, we'll have Genevieve Bexted Muskie. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Genevieve Bexted Muskie. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, the reason why I actually chose to come forward and run for the school board, um, I saw an opportunity to um, expand on where I thought there was a loss of communication, um, especially um, in the year of COVID that we had dealt with. I felt as a parent of a child, um, there was a uh, missing key, missing information, a little bit of back and forth that was missing between the school system and ourselves uh, in a time of uncertainty. And I wanted to kind of help um, fill that void. Um, and I thought that creating a, uh, a opportunity for people to communicate within the school systems between parents and school systems expectations and what have you, um, we really needed to work and focus on that. And um, create that opportunity for more opportunities. Thank you, candidate Bexton Muskie. Next we'll have candidate Ryan Wolf. I, um, so I'm kind of a weird one. I don't have kids, but I've worked in the schools now, um, partly. Oops. I can't hear her. Yeah, Ryan, you are lagging. Um, yeah, Ryan, we're going to skip you for now. We'll get, we're going to come back to you. Great. And I just felt that my expertise and my years of experience would add a voice to the board that maybe isn't there um, as a non-parent, but an educator. Uh, Ryan, you froze and you said, I'm a weird one who doesn't have kids. And then we didn't hear that <laughs> next part. Um, so why don't you go ahead and, 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 and repeat that for everybody? 
so I am um, an educator, but I kind of in a weird way because I do after school care. Um, so my role is kind of multifaceted. And I thought that that might be a good voice for the board. Um, and as a young child, my mom always said, you should serve the community that has served you. And Portsmouth has been my home for a long time. So, yeah. Right, thank you. Next, we're going to have current board member and candidate Nancy Novelin Claver. Good evening, everyone. And Sam, thank you for organizing this for us. Um, I've been involved um, as an elected official in the city of Portsmouth since the year 2000. I served on the school board for two terms. Then I served on the city council for three terms. Two of those years were as assistant mayor. And now I've been back on the school board for two terms seeking an, a third term. So altogether, this will be my fifth term on the school board. I've had three children graduate from the Portsmouth school system. And I had always been so impressed with the level of academics, the level of support, the level of um, after school activities. There's just um, an incredible amount of opportunities for our kids. My children all have done very well. You may know my 32 year old son has Down syndrome and he thrived in the Portsmouth school system. So I'm so excited to be seeking another term and, um, and hopefully we'll have a great school board. So thank you all very much. All right, thank you. Next we have our uh, current board member and candidate Brian French. Right, thanks, Sam. Uh, I'm Brian French. Uh, I've served the last four years um, on the school board. Um, I have uh, three kids, uh, all three in Don Darrow. Um, and, uh, you know, I've lived here now 14 years and I've always been instilled in me to be part of the community and try to um, help where I can. I think um, kind of my background uh, coming from the STEM fields and also from business um, helps bring a different perspective to the board uh, because eventually that's where all our kids are going to end up anyways. Um, hopefully starting businesses or being involved with math, science, um, uh, different fields. So, you know, it's all about for me giving back to the community and, and being part of the community. Thanks. Thank you. Next we have candidate Lisa Rappaport. Hi, Sam. Thanks for hosting. And hi, everyone who's listening. Um, I've been pretty active volunteering in my kids' schools for almost a decade now. I have a fifth grader at Little Harbor and an eighth grader at the middle school. Um, I currently serve as the co-president of the PTA at Little Harbor, and I handle social media for the middle school PTA. Um, I attend all the school board meetings as much as I can and try to raise questions and provide feedback when I think it will be constructive and helpful for the conversation. Um, I volunteered during the pandemic to serve on the communications committee for the school board to try to make some efforts to help improve communications, which I do agree need to be better. Um, I've also raised my hand to serve on the equity committee. Um, I am a very collaborative and creative person during the pandemic when things got shut down. I planned activities that we could do outside like skating and cardboard sled races that kept with the district COVID policies and required collaborating with the superintendent and rec and the principals. And I think we need more collaborative people to join the school board and that's why I'm running. Thank you. Right, thank you. And finally, we have candidate Liz Barrett. Hi Sam, thank you so much for doing this. Um, uh, I'm an advocate for kids and a voice for parents in the work I do every day, and so I'd like to continue that on the board if, if elected. Um, I understand policy and procedure. Uh, I interned on the Youth Law Project at New Hampshire Legal Assistance, working with education law. Uh, I have my associate's degree in early childhood education, where I focused on special education, as well as um, observed and understand various teaching styles from uh, public school curriculum, Common Core, to Reggio Emilia, to Waldorf and Montessori. Um, I, I went to state institutions. I went to Granite State College and UNH and then UNH Law. So I'm familiar with what our high schoolers are facing as far as applying to schools and, and, and preparing for schools. Um, I also went to Portsmouth schools. I'm a fifth or sixth generation Portsmouth resident. So I would like to give back to the community that raised me and raised my entire family. Uh, I also volunteer at the PTA, uh, raise my hand for the equity committee and volunteer with Families First and Seco's Birthright. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Liz. Um, so as a reminder, election day is next Tuesday where there are five open seats on the school board. We have seven candidates.
candidates. However, there will be eight names on the ballot as Tara Kennedy, a current board member has withdrawn from consideration. Um, so uh, this is a reminder that when you get to the ballot box on, on Tuesday, that uh, she has withdrawn from consideration and so she won't serve if, if she gets uh, those votes. All right, so we're now going to move on to our opening question here, which is aside from policies related to the pandemic, what policies do you think are the most important for the school board to address right now and why? And you can see the order here. And so we're gonna start off with Lisa Rappaport. I would say that addressing equity and inclusion is the single most important thing that we have to look at right now. The pandemic has absolutely in a number of ways exacerbated disparities and opportunities and in learning for so many of our kids in so many different ways. Um, I think that the school board had already started down this road before the pandemic. You know, they have a solid equity policy in place. There was already a work in progress to form an equity committee that got stalled a bit by COVID, but it's back on track. Um, I've raised my hand to serve on that committee. I absolutely believe in the work. Um, I have two gender non-conforming kids. I have a child on the spectrum and I come to the work from those perspectives and I certainly hope to see the district cast a much wider net. The committee right now is mostly white folks and mostly women and that is not everybody who lives here. So I am certainly looking forward to seeing that work expand to include more diverse perspectives hopefully going forward. Thank you, Brian French. My answer is going to be short because Lisa pretty much said what I was going to say. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, equity is near and dear to my heart. Um, honestly, you know, I, I believe it's what, you know, teachers caring about me and making sure that I had a good education was sort of my way out. Um, I started off in a, um, you know, very meager means we had in our family and we had, uh, was very blessed in getting a lot of opportunities from teachers literally pulling in their pockets and pulling out money to make sure that uh, I was able to participate in different things. And um, I'd love to be able to see that uh, become inculcated in, in what we do here in Portsmouth. That's why it's a policy. That's why it's one of our major four goals and uh, continue to work hard to turn it more into actual things that we can do um, to improve our community. Thanks. Thank you. Genevieve Bexted muskie Hello. Um, I'm actually <laughs> going to chime right along with their uh, with the uh, the sentiment of that inclusion and acceptance. Acceptance um, was a big thing for me. Um, we actually addressed this uh, something fairly recently in our PTO meeting at New Franklin. They had talked about um, knowing when a New Franklin student is entered into the middle school or high school because there's a character um, about our kids that our school system, our teachers and educators instill in the kids. And it's about inclusion. They, they really, really uh, drive home that anti-bullying, but it's about um, making sure that everybody feels included um, on the playground, in the cafeteria, wherever it be. Um, so they teach their children, our kids, um, to be inclusive and they know when anybody else is having difficulty um, when they see somebody reaching out, offering that hand of support. It's a lot of times it's from one of our New Franklin uh, kids and which we're very proud of that at New Franklin. Thank you, Liz Barrett. So I'm gonna change it up a little bit, but not too far off. This is actually a pandemic related, uh, but it goes beyond the pandemic. I think we need to take a, a look at how we're handling um, mental and behavioral health and focus on the policies surrounding that. Um, there's not a whole lot of policies uh, surrounding um, how students are treated in these situations unless they're sort of funneled into a special education process. Um, but I think we need to take a hard look at how we are penalizing and reprimanding students and how we're handling that um, and how you know mental and behavioral health play into interpersonal relationships with students, peers, and teachers and focus on the whole child instead of the behavior. Um, so whether that's policies for outdoor play or our policies for a play-based kindergarten, I think we need to really take a hard look about what we're doing here because uh, teachers are struggling with um, increased behavioral issues, especially after the pandemic. So uh, that's a major concern for me. Thank you. Thank you. Ryan Wolf. 
Um, so I think a lot of the candidates have touched on the equity. And I think it's important that we realize equity starts so young. Portsmouth lost the Head Start program. And as a child who went through the Head Start program, and my sister did, I realized how important that um, preschool, before we kind of even enter into kindergarten, how important that is to social emotional skills. Um, so I think when we look at equity, we need to start at a very young age um, and looking at how social emotional skills are taught and when they're taught. And a lot of that happens at a very young age. So if they're not getting those skills early on, then we're going to see a lot of the inequities just increase as they get older. Um, so I think looking at that and kind of equity in education from the very beginning is important. Thank you, Nancy Noveling Claver. I think I'm gonna add a different twist to this. I agree with everything everyone's saying about the school board goals of equity, wellness, opportunity, and community. But I think, I think the budget is what we really have to look after very carefully. It's something that the school board has to advocate for. Sometimes we have to bring the public in to help us advocate. I truly believe that we cannot cut our budget extensively at all. It's gonna hurt our kids. It's gonna hurt our ability to accomplish these goals of equity, wellness, opportunity, and community. Well, we will have to um, delete teachers. We'll have to delete staff and other programs if we drastically have to cut our budget for whatever reason. So I personally am looking carefully at that with our city council candidates. Um, I don't know if other departments can do it. Um, I'm concerned about the school budget. And for me, um, that's very important to make sure our budget is sound and adequate and makes sense for our kids. Right. Thank you. And Carrie Nolte. I uh, similarly agree that all of these are really important and I think all are accomplishments. I want to connect to with what Ryan said around, um, around you know, opportunity and equity from a young age. We're in a position where uh, the school um, administration and school board will be involved in guiding the plans for community campus um, in that purchase. And, and the school dis district is meant to have part of that. So really planning for those things, we need to do that at this time. And the main issue, which um, I, I think we need more policies on and connects with what Nancy just said about budget is that we have really burned out teachers and we have um, teachers that have had to do gymnastics for a year. And so, although, you know, it's both adding positions or making sure that we support them in their positions, but basic coverage, you know, parent, teachers are going to still have to leave school when their kid has COVID. And we need to make sure that we have qualified educators to fill that gap um, and substitutes to cover that load. All right. Thank you. Uh, our next question is, how will you foster innovation and evidence-based instructional practices in our schools? And we're going to start off with Ryan Wolf. So I'm a big proponent of listening to the experts. Um, so looking to the people who've done this before, looking at programs maybe that have already implemented some of these programs for equity or um, mental health, any of these, um, and looking at other case studies to see how they've worked, what didn't work, what were similar, what were not, um, and just working with the resources we have. We have, you know, great colleges near us, whether it's UNH or state colleges, or even resources we have right here in the community, like Sam Cook, who's moderating this, um, but working with those people and getting as many stakeholders involved as we can. Um, I think that's the key is we have so many great resources in Portsmouth that we can utilize. All right, thank you, Lisa Rappaport. So I, I agree with that. And I'd like to just take that in a slightly different direction and think about it more on a micro level, you know, because I have a child in special education for many years, it strikes me when I talk to teachers that they will say really every child should have an IEP or a 504. Every child should have instruction that's tailored to the way that they specifically learn and the way that they can best succeed. 
And I would like to know from our teachers what they see as the prep time and the professional development that they would want to have so that they might be able to, you know, better measure success in the ways that are actually meaningful to them and that help them provide uh -oh. instruction. So not so much the standard test that the state cares about, but what are the measurements and assessments that teachers want the time to do that they think will really help them to provide more differentiated instruction for each child in their classroom? Because at the end of the day, I think that what happens every day when the kids are sitting in the room is where we need to get evidence that is tailored specifically to the kids that are in that room. Thank you, Carrie Nolte. Yeah, and I think those are really wonderful ideas. I think also, you know, the social and emotional curriculum that has been being used in the schools, um, it, they're currently looking at new options and new opportunities. I don't see that as a role for the school board, though. I think that the our educators have been really successful in that. I do think some of the things that the school board um, would want to look at look for in their um, superintendent is their ability to, um, you know, foster change and innovation. Um, one of those things that I'd love to see and connects to both um, what Ryan and Lisa had said are some different metrics. So we know we have great hiring school systems, but I want to know more and make sure that the superintendent and the um, assistant superintendent are looking at what happens with those kids that are leaving the school system dropping out that are unsuccessful. And so we're not just basing it on college admission rates or employment after graduation. Thank you, Nancy Nobling Claver. I like what was said about listening to our own staff, our own teachers. Um, last night we had Helene Whipple, who is a Spanish teacher at the high school. She's organized trips to Costa Rica for students and, and teachers, and they bring back the knowledge of the culture, and many of them bring back the Spanish knowledge. Um, we also have Kim McGlinchey, who is a teacher at the high school, and she's organized the We Speak with the students at the high school who talk about equity, inclusion, all that kind of, um, all, all those topics. So I think we need to listen to our own people. I like, I like um, that we've done that in the past, and we will continue to do that. I also think uh, a new superintendent um, will bring hopefully some of those talents to the table and will be able to um, talk about innovative programs that he or she may have used in the past um, in previous positions. So I think we just need to look at the, the valuable asset that we have in our own in our own pool of people. Thank you, Brian French. I would echo Nancy, uh, you know, I, I, I think you, know, you put up sort of the role of school board and it's around policies and, and um, you know, taking a look at what the superintendent's doing. Um, and I'm a real proponent of measuring things as well. Um, and so when I, when I think about these uh, things, I wanna see again, um, things being able to move the needle um, in different direction as far as how, how our kids are succeeding. Um, so I do rely uh, with and continue to rely on our administration, but we also would measure uh, the impact of some of these things. And besides that, you don't want to move the needle too, or, or move the you know these different things too fast because you know you want good adoption with the teachers and, and whatnot. So <clears throat> um, you know I think you have to rely on your on your staff, but also measure it. Thanks. All right, thank you. Liz Barrett. Um, I echo some of what everybody said. I, you know, I think when you're talking about um, innovation and evidence-based instructional practices, that's going to be different for every type of class, whether we're talking special education needs or we're talking Spanish um, or we're talking science. So I, I do think Nancy's on point to say we need to listen to our teachers and let them, and also let them try things. Like I know my son's teacher is trying um, in third grade at Dondera or moving amongst classrooms and trying that this year to see how that goes. So I think we need to be open to that. Um, you know, we also need to look at who we're hiring in the future, um, especially the superintendent's role. Um, and, you know, and if, and maybe we have a, a committee, I know there's remote learning committee was sort of looking at that. And I was trying to push for that with remote learning um, so that we had people looking at thing, you know, what was innovative and evidence-based. Um, but maybe we have a point person and maybe that's something that we consider in the future. Who is the point person for these type of things and consider hiring for that uh, uh, position there? 
Thank you. And Genevieve Bexton must be. Hi, thank you. Um, there's really not much more for me to add. Everybody's actually had some fabulous points. I appreciated Carrie's and Nancy's and Brian's expertise. I, I, I believe that um, as uh, knowing plenty of people with children with IEPs, um, the importance of those um, being able to specialize the education to a child's um, where it's most appropriate. So we are setting them up for success is extremely important. Um, it's very beneficial um, for the child. Um, they're receiving that information. Um, it's super important to hit them at the young age uh, to make sure that these children are prepared for those successes. Um, so I, I, I definitely, uh, and, and I would like to chime in about the superintendent taking on those responsibilities, definitely listening to our educators. They're there um, with our children in and out every day, and they are aware of their abilities and capable, uh, what they're capable of and what their limitations are and what their needs are. Thank you. All right, so our third question is going to be the city of Portsmouth currently has no mask mandate. However, our schools, including the high school where students are able to be vaccinated, do have a mask mandate. What is your position on the school district taking a more cautious approach to mask mandates than the city of Portsmouth? And um, uh, we are going to shoehorn Genevieve right in. She into the last one and we're just going to start this one. Okay. Um... I don't think it's very appropriate for us to go ahead and just say exactly what we're going to do without knowing where we're at. Um, and I, I watched that very difficult meeting that um, um, Brian and Nancy were, <laughs> were uh, uh, attending at that school board meeting in August. And as far as I, people are passionate, passionate about what they need, uh, what they want. Um, I'm not for telling everybody what I think is best for them. Um, I want to listen to the science. I want to listen to the experts. I want them to tell me what's most appropriate. Then we look at everything when we're looking at it. It's not for me to say right now whether or not those kids should be wearing masks or not wearing masks at this point. Um, it changes every day. So it, I, that's not anything I'm prepared to say, take it off, everybody vaccinated and everybody walk, walk around with their masks on. There's, you know, uh, we have to look at all of it. So I, I do not have a, 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 a definitive answer. Thank you. Brian. Um, I have appreciated the cautiousness of um, the schools having worked in the school buildings um, even way back in June, just as we were coming out of the kind of original shutdown. Um, so I am for being cautious, especially watching other schools that have um, been less cautious have to go remote. Thank you. Lisa Rappaport. I understand that this is a difficult issue and it's one that has been quite contentious, but I, if I had been in that school board meeting in August with the ability to vote, I would have voted for the same policy. I believe that while the spread of the virus is high, which is where it is right now, and while we cannot ask students their vaccination status, that masks are just one way to keep our students and our teachers safe and keep them in school. You know, quarantines are disruptive. You know, individual students missing school is disruptive. And if masking can help to keep more of them in the classroom, I think that that is far more important than worrying about whether the mask may seem uncomfortable to some kids. I also don't think that we should have a mask policy that treats students differently based on their vaccination status. And I do hope that we can consider revisiting this in the future when community spread is lower and when the younger kids can be vaccinated, but that's not where we're at right now. Thank you, right. Brian French. Yeah, I mean, so I, I, I heard a lot of different sides um, at that meeting. Um, it was, uh, it's very interesting that such a, such a matter everybody believes are so right. Um, for me, the, the big thing was to keep the kids in school. Um, and keep the teachers uh, uh, not remote and everybody uh, everybody in school because 
you know, it was super disruptive um, the year before, and it was very hard on teachers and, and students alike. Um, and I think it was a good middle of the road. Um, and as we've seen in other districts that have adopted, um, uh, you know, mask optional, they have gone remote and back and forth and also went back to mask mandates. Uh, so I think, um, you know, this approach seems a good middle of the road. And, um, you know, I have a first grader, he doesn't really care about wearing a mask, um, it, it, but he does care about being in school, so. Thanks. Thank you, Carrie Nolte. Yeah, I, I wanna just go back directly to the question, the school take district taking a more cautious approach to the mask mandate than the city. And I think that I fully support that for a few reasons. Um, vaccines are not yet available for children under 12. Um, also, our, it, it's really the needs of our educators. So we're in a job market where um, you know, all of our teachers can probably leave us very quickly for a higher paying job um, that is safer and they're not exposed to COVID. And so I think that we could cripple our school system by, um, by removing those, um, removing masks too soon. There's two measures that I think I'm hopeful might be included in our plans. One is um, when we get to over 80% vaccination rates and the other is when um, transmission rates drop. And so I think that, that those are the two things we're going to be looking at um, going forward. But like everybody has said, um, it's all an in the moment with all the available data decision. Thank you, Liz Barrett. So I want to keep the kids in schools. Uh, so, you know, I was the one, one of the ones or I was the one that called in and asked for um, middle school to also be included uh, with uh, elementary school to, to mandate mask at uh, moderate spread. Um, with that being said, I, and, you know, a, a high vaccination rate, I think we do need to consider um, how we're approaching this when we do get down to moderate spread. So I think there is an opportunity to open it up and talk to teachers and talk to the schools at the middle school and the high school level. And uh, I mean, obviously high school is going without at moderate, but you know, are there opportunities where we could allow in smaller groups um, to take off a mask if it would be more beneficial or have our teachers not wear a mask so the students can see their face? I think there is some opportunities for improvement there but I wanna keep our kids in school and I don't wanna risk going into quarantine. And that's a huge issue when you're taking off masks. Thank you, Nancy Noveline Claiborne. I did vote for the mask mandate based on the information we got from our superintendent about the um, situation we were in in Portsmouth with the high numbers. Um, and so, and also that we abide by the New Hampshire Health and Human Services um, recommendations. So I did vote for it. But one thing that um, I'd like to talk about is the emails that we got from parents. And I think Brian would agree with me before we had the vote, I would say we got we really got a lot of emails. Half said, I want my child to wear a mask. Half said, I don't want my child to wear a mask. We had our vote that night in August. And I don't know about Brian, but since then I have not gotten one email. I think our parents respected how our administration and our school board felt. And I'm very proud of that because we all know in other communities, not too far away from us, parent groups are suing the school district. We didn't have any of that kind of reaction in Portsmouth. And that makes me very proud of our parents and our staff and everyone else that was involved in the decision. So um, I just wanted to add that point. Okay. Thank you. All right, so here's our next question. We received many, many questions specific to the student experience in Portsmouth Public Schools. Questions about when students start foreign language classes, how much art is part of the curriculum, inclusive sex education, vocational programming, block scheduling, AP classes, and a lot more. Way too many to ask them all. So instead, I want to give you each an opportunity to speak towards one of these experiences and how the board can support that experience. We're gonna start with Lisa Rappaport. That is such a huge question. <laughs> and I guess I would start by saying I don't view the job of the school board to decide at a granular level how classes are taught. That should be decided by teachers and people inside the buildings and people with experience actually teaching. 
Um, I will pick one thing out of the mix there, which is foreign languages, just because that's near and dear to my heart. Um, I studied French all the way through school, starting in middle school, through high school, through college, got to study abroad. And I think that part of raising, you know, globally competent citizens who are prepared to work in a job force that is very interconnected and prepared to embrace people from all cultures and all backgrounds absolutely should include more foreign language instruction. The issue of where is it coming from in the budget and how are we hiring more teachers? Um, I mean, at the middle school, we have one staff um, French teacher. We have a substitute for Spanish and the Mandarin program ended with COVID. So there's definitely room for improvement there. All right, thank you, Liz Barrett. Uh, you know, this is our, our large question, like uh, Lisa said, but um, uh, one of the questions that uh, was sent to us ahead of time that was part of this was how would you ensure policies and initiatives are inclusive of all students? You know, my answer to that would be um, to make sure that the equity committee has clear goals and guidance as far as what we want back from them. Um, and then and then as far as other questions go, I think arts are really important. They're always the ones that get cut. Uh, I know home ec uh, got cut. I took home ec in middle school. That position is now cut. Um, we do have science in there now, which I think is great. Uh, but I, I do think you know there is a focus right now on what we're doing for art in middle school. My understanding is that the art teacher at Dondero, who's my son's favorite teacher, along with a, many other kids' favorite teacher, is only a part-time teacher. So I'd really like to um, continue to push for that, could put, push for the budget so that we are able to um, expand our arts programs instead of cutting them. Thank you. Ryan Wolf. I'm oh, sorry, um, Nancy Nobling Claver. Um, I would like to first talk about the foreign language. My younger, younger daughter, um, who's now 30, she had Spanish starting in kindergarten. It was just that time in the curriculum of the, of the schools that the elementary school children had um, Spanish. So she took Spanish all the way through to the 12th grade. By the time she graduated, she was fluent in Spanish. I believe she had a flair for foreign languages, so that probably didn't hurt. But I would love to see foreign languages come back in our elementary schools. And every budget session, I bring it up and I ask that we put it into the budget. We haven't been able to for the past couple of um, sessions, but I, would, I, I just think the foreign language is so important. And if I can just talk about sex education for one minute. Years ago, when I was on the school board, it was a huge controversy when we voted to have condoms in the nurse's office at the high school. So the discussion of sex education has gone way back in our school system. And I think, I, I don't have any time left, but I think that was a good move in the right direction years and years ago when we did that. Yeah, thank you, Ryan Wolf. Um, so I see vocational programming and I think as someone who works in child care um, and all of you who are parents probably realize how what a struggle child care has been um, and it's in part because we don't have staff so I think vocational programs and trainings are amazing my sister um, did the culinary one at Portsmouth schools and she loved it it was her favorite um, those were her favorite classes and she um, really expanded her knowledge and became more confident with herself. So I think vocational training is amazing and talking about inclusion, not everyone is going to go to the, the colleges in the same ways. Not everyone, you know, loves reading books. Some people like putting things together. Um, so I think vocational programming should be highlighted and we should push for it in the budget. Thank you, Carrie Nolte. Um, I, uh, Ryan, we haven't met before, but I'm excited to talk to you more because um, you went the direction that I was going. And I'm gonna say this as a college professor, um, traditional university education is not for everyone. And I think we put way too much focus on um, on high school being a really intensive educational experience. Um, and also I think that the superintendent that we select needs to be responsive to currently what's going on. So we have a huge worker shortage in the trades. Um, no one in Portsmouth can find a plumber, electrician, or um, our early childhood care. It's impossible to find daycare. Um, and so I think really focusing on that and incentivizing that and really 
um, making sure that our messaging to students is that those are amazing pathways and you're filling a need in your community. Um, so I don't know what UNH is gonna say about my response, but I'm going with it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Genevieve Bexted Muskie. Thank you. Um, I am going to first uh, talk about my support of the arts. Um, uh, I mentioned um, earlier um, this week uh, that I am in the process of wrapping up my uh, bachelor's degree. Um, I finished all of my core classes and I'm ending them on all arts classes um, because I needed that creative outlet, because I needed that something different. I needed I needed that. I, I needed to be open and feel, uh, give the opportunity to express myself. And what a better way to end the five years of it's taken me to accomplish this task um, with the arts to be able to express myself. Um, positivity is something that I have actually um, yeah. been very focused on. But to also chime in on the vocational um, programs, the importance of that. I agree with you, Ryan and Carrie, you're absolutely right. Every kid is not gonna go to college and being in the real estate industry, drywallers are hard to find as well as plumbers and electricians. We definitely need to focus on that vocational programming as well. Thank you, and Brian. Uh, yeah, part of um, you know preparing our kids um, in my mind for uh, the next step out of um, out of high school is to is to make sure that you know um, they they're part of a world community um, and we are very you know the, the world's getting smaller. I work with a company that has offices all over the world, and it's embarrassing sometimes to go to Europe and have all these people speak three or four languages and speak with me in English. Um, and I can muddle along in the French or um, the Spanish uh, that they're speaking. And they're, it's taught from very early ages everywhere else in the world. And, um, you know, and, and it's real, for me, I pushed with Nancy to um, try to get that in the budget a couple of years back uh, to get that into, you know, starting at the elementary level. So I think you know, for me, that was a really important thing. I'd love to see, uh, figure out how we can get into the budget. Um, and that's it. Thanks. All right. So th that question at the, at the heart of it was a budgetary question. And we're going to skip the next two questions I prepared because we're short on time and get to the budget questions. So let me skip ahead here. Um, so um, <clears throat> the context of the budget is, it's my understanding that the budget is between about 55 and $60 million, of which about 75% of that is static. It goes towards things like teacher salaries and maintenance and transportation. And so that leaves a flexible budget in the neighborhood of 10 to $15 million, depending on the, on the year. So these questions are gonna be about the flexible part of the budget, the part that, uh, that you all can, can allocate. So what would be your priorities when considering how the board allocates the flexible part of the budget? And we are going to start off with Liz Barrett. So uh, we have right now, we have our ESSER funds from uh, the COVID funding. And so it's giving us a little bit more flexibility um, to address some needs. So, uh, and opening it up. So, you know, my understanding is that the uh, air conditioning in the elementary schools is a huge priority. So this is something that we can, uh, put a lot of those uh, funds into, but um, given that they are for COVID too, I really hope that we see what's going on in our schools right now uh, with the behavioral health needs and the social emotional piece and really take some of those funds and figure out how we can you know, divert them into services. Um, whether it's, uh, I'm, a, I'm a proponent of ABA, uh, behavior sciences and focusing on uh, ABA and how we can sort of integrate social emotional learning with um, understanding behaviors. Um, so I don't know if we need to figure out if we're, we add an OT or an ABA into the schools. Um, I'd also like to get some of the positions back that were cut uh, like the arts positions. Thank you, Lisa Rappaport. Yeah, that's another really big question. Um, I would say as part of the flexible spending, I agree that there are some COVID funds available that I would like to see addressed first to see where those can be used. One area that I would love to see discussed is how we can expand outdoor education facilities and potentially create some structures so that students can be year round outside. 
that's great for their mental health. That gives them more flexibility. So if we do have more situations where they can't be in the buildings, potentially we don't have to send them home to sit at computer screens again. Um, in terms of spending that's not the COVID special funds, I would definitely like to see a lot of that right now go towards professional development. I'd like to hear from our teachers what resources they need that will make it easier for them to do their jobs. I'd like to see more resources put into trauma-informed teaching, which would address social and emotional and behavioral needs in the classroom. And just make their lives easier after this incredibly insane 18 months. Thank you, Carrie Nolte. Yeah, I, I would just say that, you know, although it, although the school board, in my view, the school board approves this budget, that this is really guided by the superintendent, um, but that all of these considerations are kind of taken on with it. Um, I think another component of teacher um, retention is, is flexibility and funding to develop new and innovative programs. And I think allowing people um, opportunities with funding, meaning, um, you know, they can, they can purchase supplies that they need for innovative classroom methods they want to try out is a great way for where innovation starts as opposed to from, you know, the top and, and coming down. Um, and so I'd love to see some opportunities to fund that. But again, this question is, um, as everyone has said, so big, um, that this could go on, but I would hope that we would have a superintendent that would really listen to teachers and the school board on what these those options would be. Thank you. Ryan Wolf. Um, so you guys aren't allowed to tell Seacoast Community School that I'm about to say this, but more after school programs for kids, um, just, you know, whether it's sports or arts clubs, um, which would probably require maybe looking at more staff or talking to maybe paras who want to work extra hours because I know paras don't have 40 hours a week. Um, but I think just these enrichment programs, I remember as a kid, you know, if it wasn't free, I wasn't going to do it because my family didn't have the money. But I did a ton of after school things because they were offered for free. Um, so I would love to see just kind of enrichment programs for kids, as well as professional development for staff um, and talking to staff about what they need for professional development and what they might like to see that might be new professional development that we don't think about. Thank you. Brian French. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe Nancy can chime in after this, but I don't you know, my perception is the budget is not as flexible as um, as, as this question implies, because uh, there's not really a whole lot of room uh, for a lot of things. Um, but I, I do think, um, you know, part of the problem with increasing the budget is, especially for programs like um, possibly preschool or, um, you know, world language, is we want to put it in there and have it stay. Um, we don't really want like these uh, two or three year programs. If we have some extra money, um, then we can't continue to fund it for whatever reason. So it's, it's a tricky business. Um, and they're really, you know, my perception is there's not a lot of flexible parts of the budget. Um, so we have to really work and lobby with the city council, with, uh, you know, with, um, you know, our community to why these things are important and, um, and, and, to help us, uh, you know, better our community. Thank you, Nancy. Yes, um, Brian is absolutely right. There's not a lot of flexibility. There are so many fixed costs in that in our school budget that we don't have that much flexibility. So, for instance, we did have Spanish in the elementary schools for several years, and then we had to drop it. And other examples like that have happened throughout the years. So. I think what I would say um, where I would want a priority is last night we had Phil Davis, the principal of the middle school address us. And he talked about how behaviors have, de have declined like a sixth grader kind of acts like a fourth grader. I had a conversation with two elementary school teachers in the past few weeks and they said the same thing. 
the fourth graders are now acting like second graders. And that's because they've been home for a year, they've been in front of a computer screen, they haven't had the social interaction with other students. I think we need to see if we can spend some money on, as the ABA was mentioned, I think that's a good idea. I know with my son who is disabled, we've used that in the past and it's been very successful. So I think we need to look at the mental wellness of our students. And if there's extra money in the budget, we, I think we really need to look at that. Thank you. And Genevieve Beckstead Muskie. Thank you. Um, so I loved the outdoor um, idea um, from earlier because um, that's definitely something that um, we at New Franklin did a couple of years back, actually um, handed over $20,000 of raised fundraised money from selling wrapping paper and mums and what have you, um, and $20,000 to put in an outdoor classroom that our kids could utilize. We're having difficulty with the sound barrier issue. We've got more meetings coming up on that. Um, and that's something that we're fighting for too. Uh, but definitely that outdoor interaction um, could help out a lot with the whole mask idea. It allows them a space to go and be free um, to interact with each other. Um, but definitely understanding what is needed, talking to our teachers, making sure that they're aware of um, uh, topics that are brought up, um, they're the ones who are working with the kids. They're the ones who are working in the systems and they're the ones who need to tell us where the attention needs to be placed. All right, thank you. So I think we have time for one, possibly two more before we get to the open part. So I'm going to get to this question here. So our next question is going to be, the school board and administration will be renegotiating the teacher contract this year with the union. What would be your guiding principles going into these conversations? So we'll start off. I'm sorry to do that to you again, Genevieve. You ended one and started another twice. Um, and it, oh. Do you want me to go first? Go ahead, Genevieve. Or <laughs> Genevieve. Go ahead, Nancy. It's oh, you want to go okay. ahead. Um, this is this is something that I'm really excited about, but um, when I was the city council, I proposed this several times and I could never even get a second to my motion. What I think we need to do with all of our union contracts is we need a new contract for new hires. The, our contracts, I think, are out of out of, out of touch, they're, 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 they just cost us too much. If we have a new contract, a different contract for new hires that doesn't have as much vacation or um, retirement or whatever, all the priorities that you get in a union contract will be different in this new contract that new hires will have will have. So that we'll have two contracts. We'll have the older folks that have their contract and the newer folks that have their contract. It, eventually the old people will all retire and then we'll just be into the new contract that is more fair, is more easy on the taxpayer. I think the union contracts have gotten out of whack and we need to establish a new contract for new hires. That's my idea. Thank you, Nancy. Genevieve, are you, are, are you ready to go? Uh, sure. Um, I, and I think what, what you're saying, Nancy, is, you know, it's, if you think of it from a business standpoint, and that's how my mind works, um, I, I, I work in business. Um, I work in business. So I, that's how I go. And it's renegotiations happen all the time. Um, policies and guidelines change all the time because times change, requirements change, money changes. So I think what you have is a great idea um, about um, offering brand new contracts. So, you know, definitely if, if I'm given this opportunity and you are as well, Nancy, we can hopefully definitely talk about it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Liz Barrett. So I understand that with teacher contracts, there's not a whole lot of wiggle room, but I would just be looking for the fact that we're, you know, having competitive pay. So we're drawing in the most uh, qualified individual individuals. Um, and they were also providing uh, quality, affordable and comprehensive health coverage. Uh, that's huge, I think, for um, having those benefits. You know, I want to be fair. And I also think that we should stick with the merit based contracts. Um, it's my understanding that uh, four or five years ago, a few years back, um, 
there's negotiations that switched from tenured to uh, merit-based contracts and the merit-based contracts um, provide teachers incentives to um, take uh, professional development uh, programs and, and uh, take advantage of programs and development um, to uh, receive pay quicker, essentially. Um, so I do think that we need to go ahead and, and, and continue to advocate to stay for the merit-based contracts um, uh, with the cost of living adjustment. Thank you, Carrie Nolte. I'm just, I'll just say, you know, I am a contracted educator and um, working without a contract now for quite a while. And I just want to say that that really changes a culture. So I think making sure that meaning, meaning there's a lot of identity in, um, you know, them not working well together to move a contract forward. But to be totally honest, I'll defer the rest of my time on this because I don't know enough about this. I'm a fast learner, but I don't know the background. Thank you, Lisa Babaport. Uh, I, I would agree with Carrie. I would like to know a lot more about the nuances and the history of the contract negotiations before I uh, put a stake in the ground on it. But I will say that um, I own my own business. I run the books for that. I used to be the guild rep when I was a newspaper reporter years ago when I went through several rounds of contract negotiations around these very similar issues. And I would say big picture that one concern I would bring to what is a fair idea that Nancy is proposing is whether it's such a difference between those two contracts that you have a retention and morale program problem. You know, if it's too far different between what the new people and the more experienced people make, you're either going to have trouble hiring or you're going to have trouble keeping people or you're going to have a really contentious work environment. And it doesn't mean it has to be that extreme. I don't know how different you would be envisioning, but I would want to be careful about that as we would be going forward and make sure that the benefits are competitive and that the cost of living increases are competitive with other school districts still. Thank you. Brian French. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is a tough one for me because, uh, you know, I come from business too and, um, you know, promotions, bonuses, um, you know, pay raises, all are, are performance-based. Um, and it, it is tough because, you know, um, we, do, we do have some of the best teachers, honestly, in the state here. I want to keep the, the talent here and we want to pay them well. Um, but I also want to figure out a way um, to innovatively incentivize good performance. Um, not saying necessarily a stick, but good performance. Um, and I know we've had some programs that uh, were like around model teacher and it seemed a pretty complicated kind of program and love to be able to simplify things where, you know, good performance is rewarded um, to the teachers because there's a lot of uh, really strong performers uh, in our district and I'd like to keep them and reward them. Thank you, and Ryan Wolf. So I don't know the much of the history of the contract negotiation um, with the union. I will say that teachers are asked to do a lot and with COVID so the past basically three years, they've been asked to do more than teachers kind of ever have. And I think we're seeing a lot of teachers. I have friends who are teachers who've left the field and they're teachers my age, so in their thirties, who've left the field because they can make more in administrative positions and the amount of debt that many teachers have to go into to get their degree. Ryan, you've frozen again. We'll give them a second here. How much of that might be something else um, but I think that's important to look at. Right, about the last 15 seconds you cut out, like you in your opening statement, is there something from the last 15 seconds you'd like to reiterate? Um, just that we want to keep, we want to keep good teachers and also try and uh, get young people to want to teach. All right. All right, so um, this concludes the first hour of prepared questions. I prepared, uh, let me see, let me count how many I prepared, uh, six, nine, I compared nine general questions and then three questions for incumbents and three questions for non-incumbents. So that's 12 total questions of which I think we asked seven. So I will be sending the questions 
to all the candidates and they can choose to do with them what they want. If they want to answer them and put them up in some sort of venue, they're going to be able to, to do that. But I want to make sure and give our audience a chance to uh, ask questions. If your question that you submitted wasn't asked, feel free to ask that. Um, and I want to go over how that's going to work. So let me get through these. All right. So you're going to use the raise hand feature to indicate whether you would like to ask a question. Um, <clears throat> When it's your turn, I will unmute you so that you can ask your question yourself. Turning your video on ask the question is encouraged, but it is completely optional. Please begin your question by stating your name and the street you live on, exact address is not needed, uh, and state who the question is intended for. Try to refrain from asking questions of the entire group unless those questions require a quick response, something like yes or no, do you support, something like that. If a question like this is asked, then I will call on the candidates to, to uh, respond. Uh, candidates will be limited to one minute to respond, but we won't have a timer. I'm going to take the slides down so that everyone can see each other and we'll put the grid back up. Uh, in the event that we run out of audience questions and we have still have time, I can always circle back around and ask one of my prepared questions uh, to conclude our 90 minutes. All right, so let me stop the sharing here. And we have, all right, so we have Mary Lyons is the is going to ask our first question. So let me unmute. Uh, so actually that's... I think I'm unmuted. Thank yes, you. you are. Go ahead. <clears throat> so there's this question would be for um, the, I guess, new the new candidates who are not currently on the board, um, Lisa and um, in particular, Lisa and Liz, I think, there's been a lot of emphasis on communication lately. And with the use of social media, there's so much misinformation out there, especially when there are no checks and balances on the validity of what is posted. What do you see as your role as a board member when it comes to social media in relation to postings about the school and staff? All right, let's start with Lisa. That's a fair question, Mary, and it's one that I take very seriously and that I have taken quite seriously throughout the pandemic. Um, I was somebody who stepped forward to really increase communication through PTA newsletters, through email directly to parents on social media, and I did my level best throughout to fact check, to make sure that information that I was personally sharing was information that I checked with people on the school board or that I got directly from the superintendent or from a building principal. Obviously, if elected, I would even have to add more levels of you know, due diligence there and kind of step back because I think once you're on the school board, you're not just representing yourself and what you do on social media is representing the board and the district. And I would want to hand off a lot of the duties that I have been doing to somebody else on the PTA. Um, I agree with you that people should be civil and should fact check what they're doing and should be polite and constructive. I unfortunately have seen like you have that that doesn't always happen. I don't think that's something as a school board that, you know, we can control, you know, but I certainly think for my own part, I would see my role as communicating things that have been vetted by the board and by the district and by building administrators and you know, kind of stepping back my role in the PTA. But I hope that at least what I've personally put out there has been accurate and level-headed and fair to the best of my ability. Thank you, Lisa. Liz? Uh, so I would echo what Lisa said. I think, you know, her and I are both pretty involved on social media. Lisa is always doing the minutes and really doing a lot for uh, the community as far as sharing information. Um, as far as our role with the school board, I think that, you know, we would need to maybe take a little bit of a step back and, and make sure we have a thoughtful approach um, so that we're not, you know, if, if Mary, if you're releasing information from the um, from the high school, maybe that comes directly from you and it's not us echoing it. Maybe it's us sharing it for you, um, providing uh, some sort of infographic or something to that extent. Uh, I will say I did make the, you know, I don't want to toot my own horn, but I did make the flyer for tonight. So I know Lisa and I, and a lot of us are pretty adept in, you know, making creative visuals too. So I think that, um, you know, when you are trying to get information out there, I, I do think that there's more avenues than just 
um, email newsletter and whatnot. So if I could be of help to create a flyer um, or to create a video, I think we should use video communication as well um, to communicate to parents. I'd be happy to uh, do what I can to help there. So thank Becky, you. looks like Carrie wants to also respond. Yeah, sorry, I hope that's okay. Oh, I, in, I just interpret Mary's question different. Um, and so I'm gonna answer it the way I, I interpreted it, which may be totally wrong and it may have already been answered. But I think it's really important, like elections get contested, especially the city council race is contested. And, you know, I think it's really important as a school board member and even as a candidate to be in over respectful on social media because um, you are also an example within the community. And so I think, you know, although tensions are high, I'm confident whatever board gets elected, I would want to see, you know, have a, a moment of, hey, we're all here now. We work together with um, everyone that's been elected. We work together with parents, et cetera. Um, and just to really make sure those standards are clear to everyone involved and that there can be mutual agreement. Thank you. So anybody else who would like to respond uh, has something to say in response to Mary's question? Well, yeah, basically social media, I've, my only platform has ever been on Facebook is, hey, look what I did with my kid this weekend. Um, so I basically definitely have always refrained from any of those personal opinions, the attacks. I mean, um, I've read some pretty horrific things um, regarding family members, um, which are, you know, uh, hard not to, hard not to stand up for the ones that we love, um, but we try and take the high road. And that's something that I think um, as a board member, that would be something that I would definitely continue. Um, so that positivity, it's that whole positivity in me, my wellness, my, my, uh, my class that I just finished up with my wellness. And I, my focus, um, my topic was about happiness and um, trying to bring that positivity back into this world. So that social media point is definitely something that is near and dear to my heart. And I, I would really like to see a lot more positivity. We've all lived in shut-ins for the last 18 months. And um, it's time for us to come out and, you know, stop the name calling. And I, I would like to see people more positive with each other. Uh, they look like Nancy wanted to say one thing too. I just wanted to say, you know, we all know what we have just witnessed over the past 18 months, a worldwide pandemic, which none of us had ever seen before. I think we really need to thank our teachers, our administrators, all of our staff. Do you realize what that year was like for them? One day they're remote, the next day they're not remote. Then they go back to school one to three, one to one, two, two days. Then they go back three days. And I mean, that was just very, very difficult for our staff. And I think people have to be respectful. I think our administrators did the best they could do. I think our school board examined every avenue that we had to examine to make this all work. It was just a horrific year. And hopefully it's not gonna go back to that. Um, we have to hope that the vaccinations and the mask wearing and all of that is going to eradicate this whole problem or almost eradicate it. But I think people have to be respectful. And that's one thing that our community generally does, I think. So we have to make sure and we have to ask our constituency to be respectful of each other because our staff really worked hard over the past 18 months to accomplish what has never been presented to any of us in the past. Thank you. All right, so we're gonna move on to another question from Catherine Peebles. Oh, you have to unmute, there you go. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for all of you modeling respect right now. This is lovely to hear. I have, uh, in listening to all of the, uh, the questions and answers, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, a sort of a civics question, actually, because I realized I may not know a sort of basic thing about the school board, <laughs> which is what really, and maybe this is a question for Nancy, who I think is the most experienced person um, on the school board, just based on the last hour of uh, listening to you guys. So what is the role of the school board? What is its authority vis-a-vis -vis the school district? What is its relation to... Uh, you know, the superintendent, the schools, the city council. I'm not sure I really understand, actually, when I think about it, what is 
actually the role uh, and, and what are your, and, and what is the body's authority? Sorry, and you can just tell me, look, go and read the civics book online somewhere, Catherine, if this is silly. Um, but it's sort of, it, obviously it comes up as a sort of fundamental underpinning of what do you think about the budget or what do you think about practices, you know, pedagogical practices, you know, like what is the, thinking about that? I was just wondering, I, I don't think I All really right. know. Let's have, let, let, let's have Nancy uh, respond. Well, Sam highlighted it at the beginning. There are three roles of the school board to establish the budget, to hire, hire or fire the superintendent and to set policy. Our policy book is like this thick. We have a policy on just about everything you can think of that goes on in our schools. So, and we are constantly amending the policies because some of them haven't been looked at for several years. Well, we changed that a few years ago where now we go through the policy book. We always are making changes to update them and make sure that they're, they're appropriate. So for instance, last night we updated our citizenship policy. So if you look in the school board, it's online. So you can just uh -huh. look and see the changes that we made. And budget, I personally think budget, well, they're all important, but budget is extremely important because that's, that's what we live by. That's, that's how we operate our school system. And I really believe that our budget is reasonable, it's fair, it's adequate. And that's why I get so frightened when I hear city councilors say, we're gonna cut budgets, police, fire, school, municipal. I don't see how it, we have, let's say we have a $55 million budget that fluctuates all the time. If we were to cut 3%, which is what the increase will be next year because the union contracts are gonna make us increase our budget by 3%. If the city council comes to us and says, you can't increase 3%, you can increase zero. That means we have to cut $1.5 million off of our budget. How can we cut $1.5 million out of our budget without laying off teachers, without deleting important programs that we have? We might have to, who knows, there might be an administrator that we would, wouldn't have next year. So budget to me is, is very, they're all important, but budget is we have to protect that budget that we have because we're able to deliver the programs that our children deserve. Remember, our kids are tomorrow's leaders. And we need to provide programs for them that are going to make them successful in life, whether it's military after they graduate, whether it's a trade school after they graduate, whether it's college after they graduate, whatever it is, we want to ensure that they have the tools they need to have a successful life. And monkeying around with the budget isn't a good idea, in my opinion. And then, of course, the third function, the only employer employee that we hire a fire is the superintendent. The superintendent hires everyone else. So um, those are the functions of the school board. Thank Liz you. Hasn't, and Liz I missed the first, sorry. <clears throat> sorry, thank you. I missed the first few minutes I was trying to get online. <laughs> so appreciate that. Could can I add to that too after maybe Liz? Sure. I just wanted to give a sort of basic foundational understanding of um, of our, of our government system, uh, you know, I had the opportunity at UNH to do an honors paper focusing on our manager council system versus a mayor council system in Manchester. Um, so just from a civic standpoint, um, uh, the manager council system, much like the mayor has limited control uh, and the council has limited control over what the city manager does, the school board is set up in a similar way um, where the, where, we are sort of able to guide the policy and the budget and um and uh what was the last thing there i'm missing the third one um uh, policy budget and, uh, and the hiring and firing, yes, of hiring. um no the day-to-day -day control is over the um the superintendent so he's kind of like that city city manager role um so we have you know as a school board we have to be careful of of, of treading on that. And that's why you sort of get this, um, you know, other school boards are doing this and why are they able to do that? And why can't we, you know? And that's because we are a manager council system and not a mayor council system. And, and I think it's the better system compared to Manchester, but you can feel free to reach out to me uh, to learn more <laughs> if you want to on my stance on that. All right, Brian? I was just gonna add a little color to the hiring and firing superintendent because that's pretty, pretty, blunt, but you know, it's also reviews of the superintendent going over data of how the district is doing. Like uh, one of the things we are trying to create are good metrics around those four different goals. 
and figuring out, you know, we sit down with the superintendent and review those together. Uh, we advise the superintendent, we give, we give our perspectives and ideas. So, you know, the superintendent is the one employee of the, the school board, but it's more than just hiring, firing. It's, it's really, um, there's a lot more color in there. And um, we, you have a lot of opportunity to, um, you know, steer and make sure things are, you know, um, uh, you know, you're monitoring things and you're, you're advising. So it's a lot more than just the hire and firing piece. It looks like Carrie has something to say as well. Yeah, and it, it's, it's sort of just where even beyond the COVID policies, some of these roles have been more complicated. So one of the things you've heard mentioned from other people's responses is the ESSER funds. And so those were, um, you know, COVID related funds that, you know, we want to make sure, or the, the school board wants to make sure, and we as a community want to make sure that those funds get fully spent. And so sometimes that means really rapidly, and this is what I think is going to be kind of on deck for the new school board, or the, the um, school board as it becomes, but um, it's important that we fully spend down those funds, but also that there might be some finagling where improvement projects that were set up for three years from now need to happen sooner. And there's a lot of give and take we can make and, and really use um, some of those types of funds in order to um, make longstanding improvements like to buildings or things like that for ventilation. And so the role of the school board and just the realm of understanding that's required in budgets in COVID, I think got even more complicated. Um, but I just mentioned that not because I know that much about it because I have loved learning about it over the last three months um, in just what opportunities that means for the school department um, over the next you know, couple of years as we recover from COVID. All right, thank you. Uh, we do have one question that was sent to me in the chat from Shelly Lynn Saunders, who has a sleeping baby on her lap, so she can't ask it. She, she wanted to uh, inquire with Nancy and Brian, our, our current members, about the mask mandate and how it was voted on in August. There was, to, there was going to be a reevaluation every month and wanted to know what, why has the school board and superintendent not put out any, any updates? I know that's not necessarily a candidate question, but it is a question of current candidates. Or... Hold on, Nancy, you need to unmute. I, I... You're still muted. Unmute. Okay. Brian, do you want to go first? Or... Yeah, I mean, I, I think so the way the policy stands right now is basically what was presented to us is sort of this sliding scale depending on you know a mix of the uh, of the infection rate um, and of our our community and then kind of looking at the school uh, levels like high school middle school and uh, elementary and presumably you know the high school does have a, a vaccination rate that's um, you know pretty decent I can't remember the exact numbers uh, but at least you know we know 12 and up um, there's a certain percentage that are vaccinated. So the idea was to create the scale that as the infection rate goes down, that, okay, if maybe at this rate, you know, the high school can now go mask optional because presumably they're, they're vaccinated. Of course, the little, the littles, the little kids, uh, you know, 12 and under are under 12, you know, they're, they don't even have the option. So still mask mandatory. So the whole idea was to create the sliding scale. The problem is, is, that infection rate hasn't gone down. So there really hasn't been an opportunity to revisit. Um, when we get a consistent, and the other thing that um, was really relayed to us is we don't want to do shift back and forth violently and make it super confusing. Oh, today's mask optional, um, not. We want to have some hysteresis of like, okay, you know, we want to make sure we're over the line for, I don't know, a week. I don't know what the, the right number is but some amount of time where we believe, okay, it's not really gonna swing back up. We, now we can go ask high school, go mask optional. Um, I forget what we said at the middle school, um, but you know, he was gonna bring that back to the board when that significant change happens. Um, and uh, you know, when the infection rate goes down we can, and we're sort of at that level, have the board um, talk about it and talk about it with the community and then uh, work from there. But that was a framework 
that we uh, had decided on. Do, do I have it right, Nancy? Yes, I think Brian summarized it perfectly. All right, uh, Carrie, did you, did you want to add to that? Or do you, or do you have a question, Carrie? Because these the the uh, candidates can ask questions too if uh, of, of other candidates. I think that's I think that's fine. I have a question. Sam. Uh, sure. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, sure. I just yeah. I wanted to ask Genevieve, um, you know, how sh how she would deal with or if she would see any conflict if her brother was on the school or excuse me on the city council and she were on school board. You know, would you still advocate um, for the school budget if he asked for a zero base budget or would you um, also be looking for the school board to do a zero base budget? Well, not a lot really knowing exactly how to answer that. Um, I, I would have to approach the things. Um, my brother and I are still two different people. My brother and I were raised by the same parents, but we're also two different people, two different uh, points of view. Um, so I would be approaching it based on the information that I'm gathering and collecting. Um, if I did make the board um, and he does make city council, um, <clears throat> he's following his own information as am I. Um, so, there is no influence. Um, there is no, I, I, I still have my own opinions. And, you know, if, if, if you have a sibling um, that you know that you disagree sometimes, um, nicely or not, but um, none of that's going to affect my decisions. I can separate that. Um, we're two different people with two separate opinions. So none of that will influence anything that I have. I promise that I will listen to um, fight for what I think is appropriate. Um, and that's all I can tell you about that. All right, thank you very much, Genevieve. Um, and we have one more question in the chat from Julie Sheehan. Would you like to ask the question yourself, Julie? All right, I will ask. So it says, um, many candidates have touched upon social emotional learning I, I believe it was Lisa Rappaport discussed outdoor education being integrated into the SSR2 funds. I'm wondering if anybody else has anything to add on outdoor education or socio-emotional learning uh, and the SSR2 funds, as there is a new program being piloted equitably amongst all three elementary schools with White Pines isolated to the fifth grade. And I actually will put it in the chat. I will copy it and put it in the chat so that you all can read it in, in full here. So that, uh, um, Lisa, Lisa, do you want to go first? I was, you were mentioned. Go ahead. Um, yeah, so just attending the recent school board meetings, um, I think it, you know, this, the White Pines program is being piloted really as an immersive kind of um, program starting in fifth grade and then going back over the next few years through fourth, third, and lower to incorporate more kids. Um, and although, you know, as a parent of a kindergartner, I could see myself, you know, it, it, I'm like, I want my kid to do that too. I think from an educational and a, um, a practice change perspective, so my work is in healthcare provider practice change, but I think it makes so much sense. So instead of trying to do something through six years of education all at once and have limited resources for that, really focusing resources and mentorship and support around fifth grade, doing it well, having lessons learned, moving it to fourth grade, et cetera, et cetera, and kind of going down um, is actually not a sign that only certain students to me are getting that opportunity, but rather a sign that the um, elementary school leaders are 100% committed to embedding that throughout the curriculum um, and don't want it to be a one and done or just a, um, something that gets lost. It looks like Liz has something to, to add as well. Yeah, so I, I'm uh, I'm big on the on uh, outdoor learning and social emotional learning. My son went to the UNH Child Study Center, which is a, a amazing opportunity um, for students and uh, employees of of UNH and outsiders can come in and uh, do their um, part time programs, I believe. Too. So I highly recommend it. Um, but most of their classrooms outside, they had Timber Nook come in and, and do uh, the wooded classroom there. So um, uh, we did that program. And then we were fortunate enough to do um, White Pine uh, last year. 
uh, the full day program during COVID. Um, so my son got to experience that as well as um, uh, Eyes of the World uh, nature program, I highly recommend. Um, also uh, Forest Kids with Sarah Brown, she's running that program, I highly recommend. Um, there's some other programs uh, in Kittery and th uh, throughout our community as well. Uh, I, I can't say enough about um, you know, my son knows every uh, thing that he sees on the ground outside and all these fun facts that just sort of stick with him. And I, you know, as an adult, I, I wish that I had that thorough um, education and understanding, but it also provides um, uh, what kids get out of it is, is big body play and, um, and, and using manipulatives. It really works on their midline. Um, so you think it's just them learning about the trees, but really they're building um, uh, strength within their body and, and growing and sort of uh, combining the inner workings of their body with their brain and making those connections um, outside. And so, uh, you know, if you ever want to know why you're, uh, you can't see far away, it's because we don't spend enough out time outside. So I think um, the schools are doing well with their plan. There's a three-year plan that they presented at the school board meeting. Uh, so I I'm happy that there is a plan there. I do think that um, things can get implemented faster. Uh, and at the same time, um, I do applaud Alice over at Dondero, who sort of went through it with her son and got this implemented across the grades. So we really need the teachers that, you know, a teacher in each grade at every school that's going to take the lead on this um, and do the professional development to move this forward. All right, thank you, Liz. It uh, looks like Brian and Lisa both have something to say. So we'll end with Brian and Lisa uh, uh, adding and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll close. So uh, Brian, go ahead. Lisa, you can go ahead. I know you've been waiting. To, to okay, talk. Go ahead. okay. Um, so yeah, so I know this uh, the benefits of this firsthand, you know, Dundero has been doing this for quite some time um, outside, and you know, my my daughters went through um, through the different the you know through the outdoor classroom, and you know, there's so many benefits documented about what this can do. Uh, builds confidence, empathy, um, so many uh, you know problem solving skills. Um, it's just it's just wonderful. And my son is now going through it now as a first grader. And he just, you know, he's not a, you know, he's more wants to play outside, but it's like ball and, and, you know, he wants to play um, games, but he's gotten to really under, look at nature and, and talk about trees and talk about the plants and how things grow. And um, just the, listening to him talk and how confident he is about it. And the fact that he can talk to his friends and, um, and, and socialize, I think it's such an important thing. And I'm glad that, um, this is expanding um, through at least the fifth graders uh, for now, and um, I'm really excited to see, and hopefully we can integrate that with all the elementary um, grades to some, to some degree. Thank you. Lisa? I don't want to repeat what everybody else has said at this point, but I would encourage anyone who didn't watch that school board meeting to watch the presentation from the three elementary principals. It really gave a great overview. There were a couple of things that struck me about it that I think are important to consider. And one was that there were certain teachers who had a particular passion for doing outdoors work, and they were ones who were very much you know, bubbling this up. Because I do think if you want to expand it more broadly and have more education outdoors, you do have to make sure the people doing the educating are comfortable in the outdoors and feel that that is gonna be, you know, something that enhances their teaching instead of is an obstacle to them doing the lessons that they wanna do. And I'm not saying that people can't learn to do it, but we do have to have some mentoring and professional development. The White Pines program does include that, which I think is really fantastic. And I also, you know, just think from an equity standpoint that as we're doing more outdoors, that we do need to make sure that we are, you know, making sure that all of the kids have, you know, just the outdoor gear that they need to wear. You know, that's something that's been supported in the background by PTAs and by some different charitable organizations in the community. And while that's fantastic, you know, I would sort of say, you know, if the school is going to be sending kids outside, then perhaps we should be having room in the budget to also make sure that the exposure to outdoor education is equitably affordable and accessible to all of our kids, and that it's also sort of an accessible sensory experience. Um, you know, not all children feel great, you know, being in the outdoors and around all those things, and they can be made to appreciate it, but those are just two, you know, a few additional things that I wanted to highlight about that. All right. Great, thank you. 
And I just want to make sure I, everyone is, if anybody else would like to add anything, you know, since so many people talked in the, on this question, I want to give one more opportunity if anybody has anything else to add. All right, so uh, that brings us to the conclusion of our uh, Portsmouth School Board Candidate Forum. I want to thank the, the uh, candidates for joining us. We had all seven candidates. We had a really engaged conversation, which I really enjoyed. I hope everyone who joined us was able to get something out of this forum. Don't forget that you vote on Tuesday. And as a reminder, there will be eight names on the ballot that Tara Kennedy has withdrawn from consideration, and there are five open seats. So uh, once again, thank you to everyone who joined us and the candidates for, <clears throat> for um, answering our, all of our questions, and uh, we'll see you at the polls. Thank you. Thanks for hosting, Sam. Absolutely. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Yeah.